Welcome back, geology fans. If you find a rock that you know forms underground, and you're holding it in your hand at the surface, then these two terms, uplift and erosion, should jump to mind. We said previously that if you have an intrusive igneous rock at the surface, it must have gotten there by uplift and then erosion of the overburden. Well, any metamorphic rock at the surface tells you the same story and give good indications of how deep the rock formed before uplift and erosion brought it to the surface. In the past few episodes, we have seen many processes involved in making metamorphic rocks and bringing them to our view. We saw univariant discontinuous reactions, continuous reactions, overstepping of reaction lines, and many other details of how a metamorphic rock ends up in our hands. But as these rocks are generally made below ground where temperature and pressure are higher, we have to ask, what is different about down there that allows these reactions to occur? At the most fundamental level, the answer is energy. Minerals not only contain a set amount of mass, but a set amount of energy as well, and both are called extensive properties. An intensive property is not dependent on the amount of material present. Temperature is a good example of an intensive property. Temperature is not dependent on the amount of atoms in a body, just their overall state. Mass and energy are extensive properties that do depend on the amount of material present. More atoms in a crystal mean more mass and more energy content. Some of this energy is bound up in the internal structure of mineral grains, but a certain portion of this energy is available for new reactions and is called free energy. Every material substance has free energy, and there are various ways to measure it, but in geology we tend to use a unit called Gibbs free energy. In previous discussions of metamorphic chemistry, we noted that there are a number of variables that influence these reactions. Pressure, temperature, fluid pressure, and composition of both the fluid phase and the solid solution mineral phases undergoing cation exchange reactions. The Gibbs free energy varies with changes in all these variables and with mineral structure. You can take a set number of atoms and arrange them into several separate mineral species, and that same set of atoms will have a different value of Gibbs free energy for each mineral species they make. But here is the organizing principle to simplify all this variation. At any given pressure and temperature, atoms will arrange themselves into the mineral form that results in the lowest possible Gibbs free energy. Now, if we start changing the pressure and temperature conditions, all phases involved start to change their value of Gibbs free energy, but the key is that not all phases change it at the same rate. The result of this differential energy change is chemical reactions. Let me give you an example using two of the forms of Al2SiO5, kyanite and andalusite. Here are two graphs of Gibbs free energy plotted over pressure on the left and temperature on the right. In this chart, we designate a temperature that is held constant and then compute the Gibbs free energy for the two mineral phases at various pressures. We see that at lower pressure, andalusite has a lower Gibbs free energy than kyanite, and thus, for this temperature, this lower range of pressure will induce andalusite formation. Conversely, at high pressure, kyanite becomes the preferred form as its Gibbs free energy dives below andalusites. A physical explanation for this is that when you put the atoms of Al2SiO5 together to make andalusite, it's puffier, with a greater overall volume for the same amount of atoms, or we say it has a higher molar volume. Kyanite packs its atoms together closer and thus is less stable at low pressure and more stable at high pressure. Of course, there is this particular value of pressure at this temperature where the two phases have the same Gibbs free energy. And this is a point of pressure and temperature where the two minerals can coexist. In other words, it is a point on the univariant curve between these two minerals. The other graph over temperature is read similarly in that we have drawn it for a given pressure, and that at lower temperature, kyanite is the stable form with the lower Gibbs free energy, but at high temperature, andalusite has the lower and thus more stable Gibbs free energy. 
The intersection is again a point on a univariant curve between kyanite and andalusite where the two can coexist. Though adding more chemical compositional variety and phases make it much more complicated to plot like this, the overall concept is the same. Any general rock chemistry will take on the group of minerals that result in the lowest overall Gibbs free energy for the rock. This concept tells us why a mineral might start growing, such as if we were at a constant depth and pressure, but magma brought extra heat to the system, we might see kyanite turn to andalusite. But it is another specific aspect of the free energy that determines how these minerals actually grow in nature. Surface energy. Deep inside a mineral grain, each atom is surrounded by other atoms that tend to satisfy their bonds. But at the surface of the mineral, there are atoms with unsatisfied bonds, which results in extra free energy concentrated at the surface. The units for surface energy are joules per square meter, which tells us this can be thought of as the amount of energy in joules needed to increase the surface area of the mineral. This energy can act to draw in atoms to the surface and thus grow the mineral from the surrounding atomic population. But, one of the most important considerations is the amount of surface energy relative to the total Gibbs free energy. As a mineral grain gets larger, it has more and more of both total Gibbs free energy and surface energy, but the internal Gibbs free energy grows faster than the surface energy. The smaller the mineral grain, the larger the ratio of surface energy to Gibbs free energy. Let's say kyanite is turning to andalusite as temperature increases. As we cross the equilibrium point, kyanite becomes stable, but let's say we go just a bit past equilibrium. As the temperature increases, the atoms jiggle around and maybe a small section of kyanite turns to a tiny volume of andalusite. The conversion of the kyanite to andalusite involves this magnitude of drop in Gibbs free energy times the small volume made. But there is an increase in surface energy, which is a given proportion times the surface area. As long as the drop in Gibbs free energy is more than the increase in surface energy, the small area of andalusite will be stable and can begin to grow. But it can be that the increase in surface energy is more than the drop in Gibbs free energy, and the initial volume of converted andalusite would just convert back to kyanite. This is the reason some reactions overstep their reaction lines. Though the new mineral product is theoretically stable at the univariant curve, or thermal equilibrium point, it may take conditions beyond this point to get the drop in Gibbs free energy to overcome the increase in surface energy and allow the mineral nucleus to be stable and then grow. So, mineral formation can be enhanced if the reaction has been significantly overstepped so that the phase change involves a greater drop in Gibbs free energy, or you can somehow lower the relative surface energy, which can happen if you start growing the mineral on a friendly substrate. Once stably started, the nucleus can easily begin to grow, and as the mineral grain progressively gets bigger, the relative surface energy also drops. The closer the existing minerals are in crystal structure to the new minerals forming, the friendlier the substrate to help these new minerals start growing. Once the new minerals form, it begins drawing in material from reactant grains to continue growing. The atoms move from the reactant grains to the new grains by diffusion. But we want to solve a mystery. Why do some of these metamorphic reactions produce such large crystals, and then others make many small crystals? If we have one of those friendly substrates that can help nuclei get going, many nuclei form at the same time and begin scavenging the reactant minerals for material. Once the reactants are depleted, the reactions stop, and the result is many small grains. This is also enhanced if diffusion of material is low, so it tends to group in little clusters nearby. With difficulty in nucleation or increased diffusion, possibly due to increased fluids present, we move towards fewer but larger crystals in our metamorphic rock. And so we see ease of nucleation and diffusion of atoms are the answer as to why we get variations in mineral size textures in the metamorphic rocks. And with that... We will wrap up the metamorphic rocks, and in fact, 
wrap up our episodes on rock processes and identification. I hope you enjoyed exploring the various kinds of information bombs that make up our home, but when we come back next time, it's time to look at time. As we explore the techniques of putting rocks we encounter into their proper order to tell a story through relative age dating, here on Earth Explorations.